as the title of the video suggests, I think I've solved Sister Location's placement in the FNAF timeline. Um, pretty confident at least, but, you know, feel free to kill me in the comments. Or oh, so they pipe bomb in the mail. My great-grandma loves those snacks. Whatever you might think about this theory, just keep in mind that it is, after all, just a theory. A GAME! Ever since this game came out, we've been having a hard time placing exactly where it goes in the ever-sprawling timeline of FNAF. The animatronics you see in Sister Location are pretty dang futuristic, or high-tech which may lead you to think it's further into the timeline, perhaps even beyond our own present day. But no, Funtime Freddy here isn't about to pull out a lightsaber and say he's our father. The truth is that the Funtime animatronics were actually created earlier in the timeline than we originally thought, but that's not actually what we're talking about today. I think most people would agree at this point when I say that Circus Baby and the gang were made earlier in the timeline, possibly even somewhere around 1983-1995. But what about Sister Location itself? The game that you actually play where you see these animatronics trapped underground within some strange facility. A facility that, of course, belonged to the one and only William Afton. You might also be aware that the player character of this game is Michael Afton, the son of the aforementioned serial killer. Nowadays, it's pretty common knowledge that Mike is who we play as in most of these games, barring FNAF 2 most likely, the newer games, and depending on who you ask, FNAF 3. We'll get to that last one later, but firstly, let's give some more background to Sister Location. With the gift of hindsight and a plethora of books, we now know for certain that the SL facility was basically a big old experiment chamber for William Afton. It's where he carried out his fear experiments, and it's where the fun times have been stored. We know thanks to these secret blueprints from SL and books, that the fun times in particular were designed to capture and kill children for William Afton's experiments with Remnant. But all these robots actually haunted like the Freddy Five Bear of old. Well, yes, in order to give his child murder robots life, William Afton dismantled the old animatronic scene in FNAF 1, then used their metal to make his fun times. Or, if you take the fourth closet novel at face value, he actually might have melted the metal down and then injected the animatronic's asses with that soul juice. Ultimately, semantics. The main gist I want you to take away from this is that the fun times house the souls of the missing children that were originally in the classic animatronics. We see William Afton dismantle the animatronics in FNAF 3's Follow Me minigames, where Shadow Freddy leads the classics to the safe room. The programming doesn't let them go in there, so they experience an error before William Afton pops out and takes them apart like Legos. The idea would boil down to one of two things. A, William takes apart an animatronic at night over the course of about a week, brings the metallic remains back to his Faz bunker, then he uses the metal for the fun times. Or B, he does it all in one night pretty inefficiently by taking one apart, then taking that one back to his Faz bunker, then going back for another. Once again, it is semantics because either way you get the same idea, that being Molten MCI. The Molten refers to Molten Freddy, who we also know as Ennard. The MCI part of that refers to the missing children's incident that you see pop up a lot across FNAF's entire story. But Doc, what does this all have to do with Sister Location's placement in the timeline? Well, let me break it down for you. We know from FNAF 1 and FNAF 3 that by the end of 1993, Freddy's closed its doors. 30 years later, Fazbear's Fright opens, but between FNAF 1 and FNAF 3 is when those Follow Me minigames I mentioned happened. You can clearly see in those scenes that the building is in heavy disrepair. Sister Location can't take place before FNAF 1 because, duh, we see the FNAF 1 animatronics in that game. But I know what you're thinking. Doc, couldn't the company have just repaired the animatronics after William dismantled them? After all, those nasty buttons we see on the Withers are on the classics. It's a fair point. For a while, I thought that was odd too. However, here's a question for you. If the FNAF 1 animatronics were repaired after Follow Me, why don't we see them in FNAF 3? We see their casings and costumes around the horror attraction, but their endoskeletons are completely gone. Why would their endoskeletons be missing unless the metal had already been taken by the time the Fazbear Fright crew started searching for old memorabilia. Mind you, the people who put this attraction together have taken an assortment of other decor from Fazbear's past. We see an assortment of drawings, posters, masks, and arcade machines littering FNAF 3. Considering how eager and excited Phone Dude is to have found a real one when they do find Springtrap, 
Why wouldn't they have used the actual classics? Even if you want to say that the classics would have been in bad condition by the time of FNAF 3, they would still have their endoskeletons. Yet, clearly they don't. But maybe that didn't sell you completely. That's alright, I have more up my sleeve that might convince you. For the moment, let's get back to Sister Location. We learned from Sister Location's custom night ending that William asked Michael to go there, and that the animatronics didn't recognize him at first. The word choice is important there. As a matter of fact, here's the full line. They were all there. They didn't recognize me at first, but then they thought I was you. First thing to point out is that he says they, referring to the spirits within the machines. Like I mentioned before, he says they didn't recognize him at first, and that they thought Michael was his father. The interesting notion here is that although they didn't know who Michael was at the start, they eventually came to the incorrect conclusion that this man was their killer. The general idea I'm trying to get at here is that Michael knows that these robots hold souls inside of them, hence why he says they were all there because these machines hold the souls of William Afton's victims, the ones that previously haunted the animatronics Mike fended off in FNAF 1. The other thing to point out is that William asked Michael to go down there. Specifically, he asked Michael to put his sister back together, words that are undoubtedly familiar if you played or know anything about FNAF 4. I did it. I found it. It was right where you said it would be. And I found her. I put her back together. Just like you asked me to. But here's the issue. How would William have asked Michael to go to Sister Location if he was already dead? Remember when I said that in the Follow Me minigames, Afton breaks the animatronics for the Remnant? Well, on his fifth visit to the defunct pizzeria, the souls of Afton's victims appear and block his way. One of the spirits chase Afton into the Spring Bonnie costume, and you know the rest. Whether or not you think Follow Me happens in one night or over the course of a week, it's here that Afton becomes trapped in his iconic Springlock suit. The safe room eventually gets boarded up again, and he's left to rot there for a fair few years. Afton would not physically be able to tell Mike to go down to Sister Location, so what are the alternatives? Others have suggested that William might have left some sort of message for Michael, something like a note or voice recording in case William ever disappeared for a lengthened period. The issue with this is that we have next to no evidence to actually support that idea. We only know that, in some form, William asked Michael to do this and told him some details about his task. So how did William tell Michael to go to sister location? Well, although they might be father and son, we we don't often see them in the same room, but we have seen them together. We know for a near fact that we play as Mike in FFPS, and that game features Scrap Trap of course. But as you might have guessed, FFPS takes place after Sister Location for obvious reasons. I'm about to turn a chunk of people off, but there is another candidate for when Michael and William would have seen each other. FNAF 3. FNAF 3 is theorized to take place in the same year as FFPS. In that game, you play as the Night Guard at the soon-to-be-opened Fazbear's Fright Horror Attraction. Upon the second night, Springtrap is brought into the building, and fast forward to the end of the game, the place burns down. Possibly due to faulty wiring, or maybe even foul play. But if you brighten the newspaper image at the end of the game, you'll see that Springtrap has apparently survived the fire. Now, the scene from Sister Location where Michael declares that he's coming to find his father just reinforces the fact that Springtrap is still prowling around after FNAF 3. Now, I know some people think that Hudson from the Fazbear Fright story What We Found is the night guard you play as in the game. There's a decent argument for that. But for the sake of this theory, let's say that you do play as Mike in this game. You can probably already see what I'm getting at here. Michael takes the job as the night guard at Fazbear's Fright, meets his dad in the form of Springtrap, and at the end of the game, William tells Mike to head down to Sister Location. That would mean Sister Location takes place between FNAF 3 and FNAF 6, making for a rather tight timeline, but not an impossible one. Actually, when you think about it, from a narrative standpoint, it makes a lot of sense. Now, this part is mostly just my own opinion, in. We'll get to actual evidence soon, but a lot of the earlier games in the timeline such as FNAF 1, 2, and 4 take place and display events that happen earlier on in the series, mostly in the 80s and 90s. After FNAF 1, you have that 30-year gap where not much happens, and although you could place Sister Location anywhere between FNAF 1 and 3, you run into a few issues. For starters, from a narrative standpoint, it's kind of weird in my opinion for SL to just sit in this empty space 
where it's more or less departed from any other major events in the series. Now, to be fair, that's just my opinion. The actual issue with it is that you run into the same problem I mentioned before, that being the fact that William is not around to tell Mike to go to Sister Location. Another issue with it is that it means there's just a random, arbitrary amount of time that passes between William telling Mike to go down there and Mike actually going there. Even if you wanted to say William told Mike about Elizabeth prior to his death, there is a passage of time that happens between his death and Sister Location. How do I know that? Well, the animatronics and sister location all rented out for birthday parties and whatnot. We even got a filled out schedule for the fun times in the source code of Scott Games back when Scott was teasing the game. It would be weird for William to tell Mike about his sister and the underground facility, go off and get spring locked, and then Mike just waits a while before doing anything. It makes a lot more sense for William to tell Mike about his Faz Bunker, Mike proceeds to go down to said Faz Bunker, and then Mike proceeds to get scooped by the eldritch entity known as Ennard. Ennard put on Mike's flesh to escape the facility, Mike's body decays, and you know the rest. But I know what you're thinking. Doc, why would William as he is in FNAF 3 tell Mike to go down into sister location to put his sister back together when we see William in FNAF 3 and FFPS, he's more inclined to commit murder and terrorize than anything else. As a matter of fact, even if you don't think we play as Mike in FNAF 3, William is definitely open to killing Mike come FFPS. However, I don't think it's as wild as you might think. Actually, we have some precedent for it. In the fourth closet novel, we see William Afton after he's already been springlocked. After his springlocked death in the Silver Eyes, he became the springtrap we all know and love. And we see his springtrap in the Twisted Ones. However, when the fourth closet rolls around, he's actually forwent his persona in favor of being a mad scientist that's wheelchair bound. In this story, he's very clearly deep in his remnant experiments, so much so that he's taken the classic animatronics and melded them all together with the help of his daughter Elizabeth. Elizabeth, of course, has possessed Circus Baby. Or, well, technically she's possessed a Charlie bot that was turned into Circus Baby by Afton. It's a whole thing that's weird. Don't worry, that part isn't important. The important part here is that this is a post-Springtrap Afton doing remnant experiments with a loyal Circus Baby by his side. Heck, even the state of the classics being combined into this deformed metallic creature is reminiscent of Ennard. Actually, it's basically what happens in Sister Location. Only here, it's more directly Afton's fault. But hey, can you remind me of what Afton says in FFPS? Fascinating what they have become. Even as Springtrap, Afton expresses a scientific curiosity in his creations, something that we clearly see throughout the fourth closet. But also note the use of they again. Now you could just chalk it up to him referring to all of the other characters in FFPS, which is definitely a valid interpretation, but what if he was referring to Molten Freddy in particular? That might sound odd at first, but remember that it wouldn't be the first time he's expressed a particular interest in his victims from a scientific perspective. Also, he isn't the only one. In one of the blueprints from FFPS, we see that Molten Freddy has the most accumulated remnant, making it a necessary element of paragraph 4. Granted, that blueprint actually goes unused in the final game, but what it entails lines up pretty well with everything else. Now, I know that was a lot of background information, all for the sake of justification. To sum it up, I think the reason William Afton would have sent Michael down to sister location after FNAF 3 is purely for his own selfish needs. Even though Though he's already dead and watching around as a decayed furry, he's still interested in the work he was doing all those years ago. I don't think he has any desire to free Elizabeth slash Circus Baby because it's his daughter. I think it's either A, he knows she'd be a good and faithful tool for him as we see in the fourth closet and even FFPS, or B, he's interested in her existence the same way he is about the others. He wants to harness the supernatural for his own scientific gain. Mike, on the other hand, is a little less self-centered, so he'd most certainly be willing to help his sister out of the kindness of his heart. Actually, it's pretty fitting for his character. We'll get to that later though. But here's another question you might be asking. But Doc, why wouldn't William just go down there himself? Why get Michael's help when clearly William would rather strangle the guy? Well, let me break it down for you. There's actually a few reasons that you could conjure and most of them would be valid. The most notable reason I've seen when it comes to why William would have sent Mike down there is because he knows it would be dangerous to do himself. 
After all, most of these animatronics are out for revenge, and we saw what they did to Mike at the end of Sister Location. However, this doesn't make much sense either. Once again, you run into the problem of William dying basically immediately after having taken the medal from the classics. But there's actually more we can add on to that, and I think it answers another question about FNAF 3 and the idea of Molten MCI. One of the issues some people have with Molten MCI is the fact that William makes a fifth return to Freddy's after having dismantled the other animatronics. But why? Most people would say it's because he went back to dismantle Golden Freddy, but I don't think that makes much sense. Not only do we never see him take apart Golden Freddy like he did the others, but Golden Freddy also doesn't have an endoskeleton like the rest of the animatronics. The whole gist is that he's this paranormal empty suit that's ghostly in nature. What I think is more likely is that William returned to Freddy's to retrieve his Yellow Rabbit costume. Why? because it allows him to influence and blend in with the others. You might be thinking of the Freddy head mechanic from FNAF 2, which basically tricks the other animatronics into thinking you are an animatronic, but we actually have some examples that are a little bit more effective. In the Silver Eyes novel, William is seen wearing his Spring Bonnie costume throughout it, prowling the halls of Freddy's while the other animatronics hunt down the main characters. Very much a sort of in the shadows type of attitude here, only showing himself when he's least expected and when it's most beneficial. But an even better example is in the FNAF movie. In the movie, Vanessa says this. He influences them somehow. He took everything from them, but they don't remember. We actually do have some context to this, both in the movie itself and once again, the fourth closet. In the movie, we're told that pictures mean a lot to kids, specifically drawings such as the ones Abby does throughout the film. In the fourth closet, the character Carlton has to help the children's spirits realize that the yellow rabbit isn't their friend, but is their killer. He does this by gathering the torn pieces of a drawing, a drawing of the yellow rabbit with the five children. He reveals the truth of the yellow rabbit by altering the drawing itself, showing the kids that their killer is the bunny they trust. It's worth noting that in the fourth closet, William himself states that they remember me as I used to be, once again implying that the children see Afton as Spring Bonnie even without the suit. Going back to the movie again, Abby does basically the same thing that Carlton did. On the wall of Freddy's, there's a drawing of Spring Bonnie with the five kids, but after altering the drawing so that Spring Bonnie is now shown killing those five kids, the animatronics turn on Afton after originally being under his control. But why is this important to what I'm talking about? Well, we've already established that the MCI victims are also in the fun times, and we've also established that Afton is able to influence the MCI victims because they see him as Spring Bonnie. My point here would be that it doesn't really make sense for Afton to be afraid of going down into the sister location bunker, and that's why he returned to Freddy's that fifth time in the Follow Me minigames. He went there to retrieve his yellow bunny suit because he knows it helps him control the animatronics. As a matter of fact, that's probably why he got into it at the end of Follow Me. He thought it would give him control over the spirits just as it normally did. Well, we know how that turned out. So why didn't he just go down there himself after FNAF 3? Well, he's a riding bunny corpse guy. He can't just waltz into the building like he still owns the place. Although the fun times were created by Afton Robotics, in terms of corporate shenanigans, Afton's been out of the picture for a while. Keep in mind that Mike did have to apply to be a nighttime technician. He didn't just walk right on through the front doors and into the elevator. So, that was a lot of ground we just covered. Yes, I know, I could have just opened with the fact he's a riding corpse in FNAF 3, but I thought the extra context was useful. But there's one more thing I want to discuss because I know there's a lot of different interpretations about it. That being the actual scene where we hear Michael Afton's speech in Sister Location. As Michael rambles on, we see the burnt down remains of Fazbear's Fright, and at the end of the scene, we see Springtrap pop out after Michael vows to find his father. Once again, there's some interesting things we should take note of. Firstly, Mike says that there is only one thing left for him to do now, that being to find William. This makes a lot of sense when you consider the fact that the very next game in the series has William Afton as an active threat again. However, if you believe that Michael is the FNAF 3 player and that sister location takes place before FNAF 3, well, that doesn't really make sense. As Mike says in the movie, That's two things. Now, yes, you could say that Michael found his father in FNAF 3, but something else vital happens in FNAF 3, and that's Happiest Day. Now, I know that's a big claim. I'm not going to get into it here, but if you want my take 
take on Happiest Day, I recommend watching this video that I did a little while ago. I go in depth about the crying child and whatnot there, but for the time being, just trust me when I say Happiest Day is specifically for the crying child. Sound good? Thanks. I think it's definitely possible that Michael took the gig in order to help his younger brother out, and it's just a coincidence that he also came across his dad there as well. Michael helps achieve Happiest Day, the place burns down, and William sends Michael off to sister location. Or alternatively, the place burning down could have happened after that last part. If you think Michael having anything to do with Happiest Day is odd, think about Mike's character. A lot of people mistake Mike as the hero of the story when that isn't necessarily true. In every game we play as Mike, it's because he has some sort of goal in mind, usually something to do with helping his siblings. In FNAF 1, he works there after being called there through his dreams, i.e. the dream sequences from FNAF 2. FNAF 4's gameplay takes place after FNAF 1, with Shadow Freddy following Mike home and presumably causing the nightmares Mike has. Sister Location is about Mike helping his sister Elizabeth, and FNAF 6 is Mike finding his father to presumably get revenge or put an end to Afton's reign of terror once and for all. Mike is clearly aware that the animatronics are haunted, but he does little with that information. You see this in the movie too with Mike and Abby. Even after Mike finds out that the robots are haunted, he's only interested in saving Abby not setting their souls free. However, by helping the crying child and Elizabeth, Michael is also helping the other spirits by proxy. That's why I do think we play as Mike in FNAF 3, because it makes the most sense for Mike to want to give his brother the birthday party he never had. Happiest Day's literalness will always be a bit weird, of course, and I think that's a story for another day, but I think you get the idea. On the topic of the attraction burning down, did Michael actually burn it down? Or was it an accident? I think you could actually make a decent argument for both. Michael could have started the fire in hopes of killing his dad, or it could have had something to do with helping the crying child, or it honestly could have just been faulty wiring. Just like the Freddy's of old, this place is clearly not up to code. It's worth noting that, in Michael's speech, he assumes his dad is still alive. This is where we kind of get into what I call the domino effect of FNAF, where because these things line up, these other things have to happen. For example, William has to be around in some fashion in order to tell Michael to go to sister location. Because William tells Michael to go down there, Mike ultimately gets scooped, the eldritch entity known as Ennard climbs inside of him, and Mike becomes a rotten, decayed corpse, hellbent on finding his father. However, William cannot have told Michael to go down to sister location after FNAF 1 nor before it, but we know that William dismantled the animatronics after FNAF 1, but that he also got springlocked at the end of Follow Me, meaning that he still couldn't have talked to Michael. For many years, Mike lives without his father. He doesn't know if William is still alive or dead. He doesn't have a reason yet to want to find his father. Yet, by the time Michael has this monologue, he has been in contact with William and he knows that William is still alive. Something he could not have known prior to FNAF 3 because Afton was rotting in FNAF 1's safe room for however many years you think he was stuck there. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Basically, I'm reiterating my point. I think that FNAF's sister location takes place in 2023, after FNAF 3, but before Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Simulator. I think you play as Mike in FNAF 3 and that it's after that game that William instructs Michael to go down to sister location, where his sister resides in Afton's old underground research facility. SL happens, Mike dies but comes back to life, and he vows to find his father as it's the last thing he needs to do. Alright, okay, I think we've covered all the bases that I wanted to cover. Hopefully you found this theory just as interesting as I did. Oddly enough, before I sat down and started writing this theory, I really didn't think trying to pinpoint Sister Location's placement was a worthwhile endeavor. Like most people, I kind of just opted to plop it somewhere between FNAF 1 and FNAF 3, because that's the simplest way of going about it. But the more I thought about it in the shower, true story, I concocted this entire theory while taking a hot shower, the more I realized that there were things things I think a lot of people mostly just glossed over. I'm actually pretty confident with how this one turned out and what it suggests. Like I said before, it makes for a pretty tight timeline for the latter half of the original story, but I think it makes a lot of sense. 2023, man. What a year to be Mike. Night guard, technician, and even a restaurant owner. That's what we call moving up in the world. In any case, I hope you enjoyed the video. Feel free to leave a like or a comment down below. It can even be a death threat. I really don't mind. If you're really feeling gracious, a whack of that subscribe button is always appreciated too. As per usual, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. Peace out.